We shouldn't be doing that. Oh, that's not good. Check the connections. Check, check, check. Yeah, whatever you did, that Okay, it's fine. I didn't, I didn't do nothing. It's just, it's the computer catching up. Oh, okay. And hopefully not overheating like it did last time. Anyway, that was the main problem that I was dealing with before. Now that that's fixed, I can uh, move this over. See, we're running at 61%, which is much better. I was at 100% CPU. And anybody trying to watch that show could see it was just falling and falling and falling on my face, quite literally. But we are here to talk about greenhouse seeds. I put these seeds down two days ago. Two days ago and they've already popped and they've already popped and they're ready to go. So um, that's very important to understand. Uh, seed germination, I mean, right now we've got a lot of, of people my age. Right, I'd say through 30s, right through to their, their, their 50s that are owning their homes or, or paying off their homes. And they're thinking, man, I can legally grow four plants. I'm not going to pay no $16 a gram. These guys apparently can grow for, you know, 50 cents to $1.50 a gram. So why would I, why not do it that way? So for, for those people, we thought, well, what better way to teach than to come out and, and show people this is how you do it. So on today's show, I have Vicky that's able to zoom in and zoom out for me and be able to show you guys what I'm talking about. Like right now in this cup, two days ago, I soaked my seeds. Now I soaked them for a full 24 hours. So when you soak your seeds for 24 hours, um, you then plant them. You put them two millimeters under. I, I went through all this in detail. It's on my Facebook channel. It's sorry YouTube. I know you missed that part, but every you'll be on every other part from this point forward, uh, as well as Facebook. So this will be from uh, literally from seed to fruit. We'll be going from uh, you know literally. Um, from from seed to the oil however you want to word it but when you get to this stage you'll see on the top there it's growing out the, it's growing out the top i'm just going to pop it off here and uh go from there um you'll see the moisture too that i talked about um condensation this is stuff that'll build up using the greenhouse methodology i implore anybody to look out my videos and watch the last video that was in but um, that there is, is the beginning of your, uh, of, your, of your seedling. So every time it's 100% successful. So the reason I say this is because unless the seeds are dead, then this will work. So keep that camera there for a sec. We'll go through number two. And just pop that off like that. And there it is. So you got your second one that's up. So you got two up. So these are now, again, you don't want to hit them with bright light. Don't go sticking them right into your, your big 600 watt or 1,000 watt light. Um, that's not what you want to do at this stage. So there's number three. Now this was the King Tut seeds. Remember I said I've never had such a small seed pack before of only three seeds. So this King Tut's supposed to be really good. So there's one, two, and three. Um, that's, uh, that's done. Um, now the thing about the, the other seeds, now this is what I also wanted to get into was the, the varieties that we have and the different methodologies that we have. And I know everybody's got a methodology, everybody's got a variety. There's no right or wrong answer here on Cannabis in Canada. There's only what works for you. And I'm teaching you guys what works for me. These three seeds popped in 48 hours from when I put them down to when they're standing at the very top of the, of the plastic and I pop the plastic off. Now what they're, they got to get to, you see the, there's water on the top of these. If she, you know, if you zoom right in, you can see there's water on the top of the leaves. That's how moist it was in there. That's why I call it the greenhouse methodology because I keep the humidity way up over 50%, you know, so that I know that there's constantly, it's like a rainforest in there, <clears throat> but it keeps even moisture around the husk of the seed until the seed's radical pops out. Once the radical pops out, um, and I might be saying that wrong, R-A-D-I-C-L-E, I believe it is, but it's, uh, I may have the spelling wrong. That could be one of the things. You guys ever notice that your, fa your facial recognition doesn't work on your phone? That like totally sucks. And we'll also be talking high voltage dabs. We got a big giveaway coming up. My webmaster is just working in the background for our website. Um, 
and, and it goes, it's where you can sign up and you can go through and you're, there's a bunch of different things that you'll need to do. For a mass giveaway from one of our sponsors, you guys remember the 12 days of Christmas with Green Planet, we gave away over $12,000 in, in stuff. So it was, uh, it was a, lot of, uh, a lot of fun to, to do that. Um, and we'll be doing something similar with, uh, with a couple of different sponsors. Let me just get into my, uh, get into the phone here. Now, if there's any questions at all, see Germination 101. This is what we need to know. Um, because again, when you, when, you, when you stand on Facebook and say, look, motherfuckers, this shit's gonna pop, there's a 100% success rate or the seeds are dud. And I can show you why. Now, usually you can tell the seeds are dud, as I said, when you're soaking them. You take your seeds and you dump them in, they should float around on the top of the water for at least 12 hours. Then you just give them a little tap. And if they sink to the bottom, they're viable seeds. If they don't sink, they're not viable. There ain't nothing in there but air. That's why they're floating like a raft. They're just a little husk. Again, that, that hard part of the seed, the what we call the husk. When that cracks open, you get what's called the radical. And that comes out and it both grows up and down at the same time, making a taproot. And of course, what protrudes through the top of the soil. And um, that's how you get to these, which is your seedling. Next stage for these is for them not to be under too bright a light. The biggest mistake people make, they go and buy $80 Miss Seeds like this. They crack them, they get them looking nice like this, where they're young babies, <coughs> young seedlings. Then they go throw them under a thousand watt light and wonder why the thing's dead when they come back in six hours. It's like the, the shock of the light spectrum is no different than a human. If you haven't been outside in the sun in 20 days and then all of a sudden walk outside in the sun, it's going to blast you in the eyes. And that's what you're doing to the plant. So stress. Remember what I always talk about. Stress directly impacts your outcome of your yield. I don't care whether you think that the stress that happens at this stage matters or not, but you can see how gently I even hold my cups. I don't want any stress on these plants any more than necessary um, because any stress is a reduction in yield. That's how I think in my mind, in my process. But again, I'm, I do this consistently and I've been doing this consistently for a lot of years. Um, let me get onto YouTube here. Um, oh, we only got a couple of people on YouTube today. That's good because I don't have a way to, uh, to get this out. I, I was birthed off of YouTube in 2007 and been doing these shows ever since. So uh, I'm going to flip back over here. It seems we got more interest on uh, Facebook today than, than anywhere else. So I'm going to get into that. And uh, if you guys are wondering what I'm dabbing on, it's some high voltage. Bam. LSD. High voltage LSD, which happens to be my favorite. Um, to each their own. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's very important. Uh, but e e each, uh, each stage of this, of these seeds, again, these are the King Tut seeds. There's, that's why there was only three. So each stage of this growth, we're going to bring to you guys live and, um, you'll be able to see it from literally seed to, uh, to final stage, whatever that stage might be, whether we decide to make bubble hash, uh, some of it might get, uh, like the trim, for instance, we might use that and make a little bit of home bubble hash, show you guys that. We might turn around and then take um, take some fresh frozen bud and, and show you guys how to make diamonds. Um, there's all kinds of stuff we can do, and we have fun doing that. Most importantly, is taking you from seed to fruit, so that you know how to take your seeds and complete it. And if you've never been through a crop before, that's okay. Come along with me. Come with me for the ride. Just do what I do, and you'll be okay. You know, follow the simple inst instructions. I mean, they're really not, they're not complicated when you dial it in and when you go along with other people. This is what I used to do, like doing my grow show, but I never got to interact with people and, and hear what they have to say now, or, have, or, or what, the, uh, what people have to say in real time feedback. You know, if you have a real time question, I'd love to answer it. The problem was before with YouTube, people would give me answers and, and, or questions and I wouldn't get back to them until a week later by the time I was done answering everybody's uh, questions and, and often sometimes getting schooled myself in, in the right areas of, uh, of cannabis. So um, yeah, with that being said, uh, we do, like I said, when this, uh, when this giveaway that's going to be happening with, uh, with high voltage, it's, it's a massive giveaway. It's not going to be like these smaller $300 giveaways. When we do this big giveaway, 
uh, for high voltage. We're building up to it, so my webmaster is not quite ready to release it yet, but it'll just make sure you're registered with CannabisInCanadaInc.com. CannabisInCanadaInc.com. If you're registered, you're eligible to win on our channel. Um, that's one of the prerequisites, depending on what the campaign is. Now, this campaign is going to be so big that it, it, we, we plan to... Uh, we plan to run it for at least 30 days, so it'll be well worth the time. Um, seeds become less viable over the years due to oxygen. Yes, they do, and you're correct, Austin. Um, they, are, they, they, they become less viable over time due to oxygen. They become less viable over time due to light. They become less viable over time due to moisture of any sort. So if you live in the rainforest, don't take your seeds. Or make sure it's an airtight container. So again, this is where you keep an airtight container. We used to use the little, back in the day when shit was illegal and, and you know we weren't talking about legal growing, we would store our seeds in a black film container. Remember the little Fuji film containers? They were great. That's how we stored our seeds. That's how we carried them around. And to this day, I have my seeds in all kinds of containers. You know, uh, I have all kinds of different genetics from all around the world. Um, you know, like right now, these here are from are from Paradise Gardens back east, uh, the Three King Tut. But the five yummy that are up there, the strains called yummy, it's from resin seeds. They're from, they're from Spain. I got a question for you. Yeah. How do you tell the difference between male and female at six, at six weeks? At six weeks from here? Well, you're you're talking about at the thirty day mark. It's not always six weeks. It can be it can be thirty days to six weeks. You're right. I, I would give it an extra week. Um, Again, spotting a male from a female. Males grow taller than females. That's the first thing you look for. Um, you know, when you're just kind of scanning, if you're doing like 50 seeds, something like this is easy. You know, you just, you look at each plant individually. But if you're doing a, a massive seed project and you're back crossing for stability or something, it's different. Separating a male from a female at the, at the age of 30 days, or even better, you know, 45 days, you know, if that's how much more time I got, you know, to be able to tell a male from a female, it's not hard. Males are growing taller. Males will be very distinct in the way that they grow. They'll grow alike. And the females will all be a little bit shorter. Most importantly, the males, you know, they don't grow balls, but they also don't grow hairs. So the females will be growing the hairs. Now there are little, People get confused with, with the different hairs that are on there, with the hairs I'm talking about, and it's not part of today's lesson, but honestly, when this one gets up to 30 days, it would be the same thing, only it would be a much stronger plant. Under here, I'm looking, is there a little nub? And if there's a little nub, I wish I could show you a picture of a male. One sec here, I'll actually grab a picture and show you. Um, so a male would have like a little nub and not a hair going out. Now a female would have hairs coming out both sides. Then you know you got, a, you got a stable female. You know, that's fine. You could also get one that has a nub on this side and has a hair on this side. And that's called a hermaphrodite. And that's very dangerous because it can hermaphrodite your garden. Um, it is what it is. But uh, let me grab some pictures here. Um, male cannabis plants. And being able to spot them when they're young is the most important time because there's a nub I'm talking about. I pull this up and I'm gonna send this over here. Oh no, I do it this way and I gotta do desktop presenter. I wasn't planning on pulling this up so just bear with me because I'm kind of doing it on the fly. Okay, so there it is. Now there's a male I'm talking about. You see the little nub? Now on the right hand side, you see a female. Male versus female cannabis plants. Do you guys see what I'm talking about? The little nub? Right here? Look right around this arrow, it's showing you. Look at the nub. So this is what you're looking for. Again, as you're going down, males, when they're later, flowering stage, 12 and 12, photosynthesis starts, then you're gonna to start to see balls like this. Whoa, it should not get back to the point of balls. 
um, you should never have that happen. Um, that's the one thing I can assure you of. If we take a look at any of these um, plants here, I'm looking for another youngin. Because um, again, if I spotted this on my plant, I'd be out. That plant would be out. But at the same time, you can pay attention to them. You can watch their, their difference. One thing you don't wait for is something like this. Here's a male, here's a female. I told you guys, hairs, female. I know this is very simplistic to, to human beings as well. Hairs, female, balls, male. It's not that complicated. So I, now to get back to the question, let me just, I know I've been jumping around here. Um, we like to do that on Cannabis Canada. Um, excellent question though, and thank you for that. But it, it's important to not only say it, but to be able to show it. So for me to be able to show people, no, this is what you don't want. You know, that that's a fully flowering plant. You don't wait till that stage because if you wait till you see balls, I can guarantee you pollen's already in your room. Pollen's already gotten around and has pollinated your plants. So the, they're early openers are called. You know, so don't wait till you see a big bunch of balls on your plants and do not go into 12 and 12 unless you take a good, let's, let's just go back to this page for a second. Um, this is important information. Um, if you go back, let's find a young in here. Um, here's another example. Uh, well, where's a vegetative, vegetative male? Um, see, they're all pretty much showing us the same thing here. Even here, male versus female, you guys can see considerable number of hairs here in this one. Here you got a nub, but no hairs. So this nub, if I seen this at 30 days, I'd be saying that's a fucking male. So I'm gonna separate this from the rest of the group just while I study it, because I know as long as I got it under 24 hour lighting, yes, 24 hour lighting, I don't use 18.6. Um, the plant does not need to rest when it's in veg to each their own on that you know, your choice of lighting and, and, and cost savings on your electricity and however you view it. Um, but I, I run my lights 24 hours. I know they can't go into photosynthesis unless they're auto flowers. So I don't have to worry about, I don't have to worry about them flowering out. So what would I be looking for? I just showed you what I'd be looking for at 30 days, you know, around that. And you're right, some strains are later. It's a good example of strain varieties and strain differentials these strains were put down two days ago, soaked for the same 24 hours as the seeds that came from Spain, but those seeds haven't even popped through, while well, two of them are just popping through the soil this morning. So on day three, they're at, or day, yeah, day three, they're just popping through the soil. Now I know most of you all out there are thinking, God damn, I use the paper towel method and it takes like four to five, six days to do that. Well, that's probably because you're not soaking your seeds 24 hours beforehand or 12 hours beforehand. That's popping them, popping them, popping them. You got to pop the seeds. You got to pop that husk. The husk is what's around there. If you've got old seeds, I talked about this on my flash show on, on, on Facebook, but it should be noted. If you've got old seeds, get something to scrub the side of it. A nail file, a matchbox, you know, whatever, sandpaper, something that's not going to cut the seed open but it's gonna scrub. We call it scrubbing method. It's for older seeds that have been sitting around a really long time. Your buddy's had them in his basement for fucking 10 years, whatever, and you wanna pop those seeds. Well, then you're gonna to need to use that scrubbing methodology, then soak the seeds, make sure that water gets into the husk and into where it needs to get, which is the embryo, which is the actual, eventually becomes a radical and eventually becomes your taproot and sends down and gets everything going. Uh, what happens in the root determines the fruit, which is why I say taking care of these plants from, the, from when they're babies to when they're adults is no different than a human being. You take care of your baby from when they're a baby till they're an adult, they shouldn't have any harm or injury if you do your job right. And the same applies to cannabis. You really gotta, you gotta pay attention to what it is that you're doing. Um, I can't say enough about that. And what I'd rather do is I'm going to play a video here. I'm going to take some time off, give you guys a chance to really dig into this. I'll be in the chat and you guys will be able to, to, to chat along with me. 
But um, I want to definitely want to get into. Um, da, 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 da. I wish I could tell more. I want to definitely get in in the video. I don't want to play it just yet because we're going to, to be able to discuss it afterwards. But it shows the paper towel method. It shows the standard just plant your seed in dirt and just let the crusty get on t crusty on top. Again, why did I have plastic over the top? So that we kept condensation. I call it the greenhouse method. I came up with that myself years ago, but I thought about why, how do I keep moisture trapped inside because I couldn't let the top get hard. I was always worried about whether my seed had enough strength to push through the top. If you go any deeper than two millimeters, you know, you're risking that that seed might not have the strength in its, in its radical to actually push through, to, 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 to push itself up and in through the top. And, uh, and there, then you won't have the growth. And that's one of the biggest problems. So it may not be that you didn't have a viable seed. It might just be that you planted it too deep. So there's a bunch of different questions that come into effect um, over this. But when it comes to oxygen, light, anything like that, if you're storing your seeds, store them properly, especially if you're going to pay all this money for them. And don't buy from an LP. Don't buy your seeds from them. Don't support that conglomerate. The reason I say that is because they're the ones that are putting genetic markers in our seeds. And we cannot have this. We cannot have people starting to Monsanto um, cannabis. It's not cool. they, they already Monsanto corn. There's only one color of corn. There's only one real flavor of corn or a couple flavors of corn. You see what I'm saying? They did this to tomatoes as well. Are we going to let them? Are we going to let them do this to cannabis? That becomes a question. And it's very, very important for us all as Canadians to look at because you know what? The other countries, they don't have a constitution like ours. Uh, they don't have a charter of rights and freedoms like ours <clears throat> that sticks up for these things. So this video that I'm, that I'm going to play is going to, I'm going to do this every week to rehash this. I know some, some people have said, why don't you do watch parties? Well, I could do a watch party too if I wanted to. But I've been messing around all morning long. I need to get to dabbing. So I'm going to get this shitty ass dab rig. This is the one I'm not worried about breaking on the show. Because then if I look foolish, I don't break a $500 rig foolishly. Um, but I'll keep chattering here. If you're wondering, again, high voltage LSD. Do not miss the high voltage LSD. You can see that shit looks creamy, doesn't it? Nice. That's the real shit. But um, back to the uh, back to again the discussion on germination. I need to get into this in order to um, properly address the questions. There, okay, that's how I get into it. There. Why isn't the cup full of soil? Uh, that's a good question. Now, if you're going to put cellophane over the top, right? Your seed doesn't really have anywhere to pop or grow or get any sort of strength. So I always give myself about this much space, about an inch, not much. They don't need light. A seed is under the ground. Just think about this, Keith. A seed is underground, it's under soil. It's dark when it pops. It doesn't need light until now. And at that point, if I didn't have enough, you can see I, I, I can fuck around with it now. I can play with it. I've given it a chance to grow high enough that I feel it's, it's going to be strong enough. Now it's where the light really hits the cup right here. Boom. So each one of these, boom. And this one, boom. They're all right at the level of the cup. So I don't know what you mean about the light. The soil's down. Sorry, I know what you mean now about the soil. The soil's down, but that's the reason. One, you want to keep a little bit of oxygen in there. You want to keep a greenhouse method in there. You want to keep over 50% moisture and humidity in there for a faster germination rate. The reason I say that is not because you want the moisture on the top green foliage. You want it on the husk of your, of your seed. You want even moisture in here. You don't want the cup drying out. You don't want anything going wrong. So the way that I figured is just to put that over, put an elastic band around it, let's see what happens. All of a sudden I was popping seeds in three days. Then I started realizing I was getting a huge success rate, except for the seeds. And when a seed didn't work, I dug it up. I wanted to know why it didn't work. 
then I realized it was a dud. It was a dead seed. So it wasn't that the methodology failed. It was that the, the seed failed. But it was a good question. Uh, having that space there definitely it, it is by design. Um, it allows the seed a chance to grow, give it like itself a little bit of stability before you introduce it to the next light, which will be a fluorescent light of some sort. Again, don't go throwing it under a 1,000 watt light. Some strains can take it, some strains can't. I don't suggest it. You know, it's like some people say, go stick it out in the sun, and it'll be just fine. It would, you know. But under HIDs, for whatever reason, some don't respond well to certain high-intensity um, spectrum after having a low intensity um, spectrum. Now, let me just see here. I got to go through and try and get some of these comments here. So that was a great cup on, or great question on the cup. Um, I'm glad you caught that, Keith. Good question. Um, just seeing if there's anything else. I can't go any further back on comments, so I apologize if I missed any. Now, the best way to back up what I say is to show the paper towel method, to show you the cup method, which is what I've taught, and then I've also taught you the greenhouse method, which is my own methodology that I've been using. I've been teaching it on YouTube since 2008. It was the first time I taught it, and I've been teaching it ever since, and uh, it, it's what works for me. It's not about right or wrong, but after you watch this video, I really, really, really would love to have some feedback. It, it would be really good to, uh, to get some feedback on the two methodologies and what your thoughts are. Because remember, when the radical, once that seed pops and that little white, you know, root, what you would say is a, the beginning of the roots, that radical, if it's exposed to light, it's stressed. If it's exposed to oxygen, it's stressed. It's usually underground. Remember, it's used to opening up and being in the dark, not being fucking bombarded by light. That's the reason I don't use the paper towel method. Or if I do use the paper towel method, I use it in the dark with a green light. There's a reason for all this, man. But I'm, you know what? I'm a little neurotic. I'm a connoisseur in my growing and in my using of cannabis. So I'm very proud of that. So you guys enjoy this 17-minute video. It's very informative. And then we're going to have a discussion about this afterwards and the different methodologies used in it. So, um, yeah, enjoy this. And uh, we'll see you guys in about 20 minutes. Cheers. Welcome back to another edition of Cannabis of Canada with Jason Wilcox coming to you from British Columbia, Canada. Uh, man, it's been 17 months of fighting the government and, uh, and working real, literally on impact statements and uh, now present statements for cross appeal and it's taken away from my time to be actually back in the garden. So uh, some of the things that come with going back to the garden, which I'm now doing, is uh, being able to first deal with your genetics and the stability of your genetics. So it's very important to understand that when you have a seed set, in my case, they're soaking in here, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, you get your seed set, you want to know what to do with it. Now, in this case, I already have some planted in here. Um, I pre-soaked the water, um, and for the purpose of video, I've got six seeds here um, to run through. I'm going to run four in here, and I'm going to run a couple in there, um, because I really don't like the paper towel method, and I'm going to show why. Um, so. Uh, basically, with this method, the, the thing I want to get into here when we're talking about genetics is that what happens in the root determines the fruit, no matter how you cut it, okay? And what happens from day one, from how well your seed, whether it, even when it has to fight its way up through the soil, if that soil top is dry and it's not easy to fight its way up through, that could potentially uh, cause stress to the plant and either cause failure for it to germinate or cause it to become retarded and hermaphrodite on you. So there, there's small things. I mean, there's no super science. I mean, for years we farmed and people just throw the seeds in the, in the, in the ground, knock some dirt over them and they come up. And that's a fact. You know, they're, they're, and then there's another way to approach it, which is a contour approach to keeping stable genetics. The way, the way that you get them is the way that you raise them. And of course, they're predisposed. How much cannabinoids are gonna produce, um, everything's predisposed. All their phenotypes, the way that they're gonna grow, how tall, um, how much they're gonna produce, all that's predisposed in the seed. But it's your job to keep those traits strong and when need be, potentially farm them to, to, to strengthen them further. So, 
I'm going to put my medication out here and start talking a bit about this. So these have all been pre-soaked, as I said. Now there's been seeds already planted into here. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get the first part on film, so I wasn't really thinking about filming it. And uh, what I'm doing here is you'll see that I have seeds soaking in here. And this is something that I'll bring up and I'll just ask my camera person to zoom in on there. You'll see that seeds soak. Now, some people will say soak them for 24 hours. Some people will say soak them for, you know, a couple hours. Some people will say soak them for 12 hours. Some people will say don't soak them at all, that you'll drown them. So on that note, um, when we look at whether it's, uh, whether it's been drowned, um, yes, you can drown your seeds. So me, I personally, I soak them until I look for when they start to sink to the bottom. Like in this case, we got like one sunk to the bottom, that's it. And the cask. Um, what's called the cask or what's known for, for layman's terms, the seed shell um, or the cask is it, it absorbs the water and that's what actually triggers the propagation of the plant or for it to actually start to explode. And uh, that water going in equally into the cask instead of just a little bit sucked in here, a little bit sucked in there. You know, we like to draw it in evenly, which is why pre-soaking in my own opinion is optimal. We've already pre-soaked some and planted a couple in here. Now this is the purpose of, of research is, uh, and also for, for video proof, is that these are just gonna be raised old farmer school, fully soaked, ready to go, plant seeds, leave them alone, they're done. So we're not gonna worry about those. Now the ones that are soaking in here are gonna need to come up to the top so we can actually plant them and get into these other methods. Now, to me, there's only two methods people talk about, paper towel method, which we're gonna get into, and this method, which is I call greenhouse. I've taught this now for six years on my channel. Um, greenhouse method, make sure your ink is st sticking out. And just make a little hole where you plan to put your seeds in. Now the hole should be no deep, deeper than... Um, you put the seed sideways, you look at the width, it should be no de deeper than twice that. So basically the seed's just under the soil, but enough to keep it dark and uh, moist, and, and that's where uh, the moisture content is very important. Now by popping the seeds up here, I can just grab them, and because none have opened, now be warned that when you use water, the way that I've just shown you, and you soak them, if you're not paying attention and you let 24 hours pass, uh, that very well may be a uh, uh, damaging thing for you, because what will happen is over those 24 hours, um, you could get rot and what happens is they crack open and the tap root comes out and in some cases I've seen them grow really big in water you know and what we were testing around on purpose and they can get away with that I've seen guys take them and transplant them and they still work I say it causes a lot of stress again on those original genetics seeds hold a lot of power those big plants we see later those big yields they start from these seeds right here and that's an important thing to uh, to focus on so with that part being done, I'd like to now focus mainly here. Um, so paper towel method, traditionally, and again, use a fungicide or something. Now, hydrogen peroxide, simple, over-the-counter, you can use that to put on here to help sterilize things. Now, because none of these seeds are cracked open, I'm not worried about touching them. Now, the reason I don't like this paper towel method is we're going to actually get into this. Um, this is important. It's part of the reason I'm doing this video because people keep asking me this question and uh, I haven't really been able to get back to anybody, but I plan to. Check out CannabisInCanada.ca if you want to learn more um, because we're definitely going to be coming back with a, a lot of new videos and they're going to come touch on things like this that a lot of people don't seem to want to talk about. If I wasn't so busy with stuff like this with the coalition and needing to raise funds with medtainers and custom glass and everything else to try and fight the federal government for a quarter million dollars so that we can keep doing this, um, I'd have more time to actually play around with teaching. That being said, method one, straight planting. We've got the paper towel method. Now, ultimately, I'm going to bring this up and just let my camera person zoom in on it. And you can see none of, this, none of the seeds are cracked. None of the, none of the casts have opened. So of course you don't see a radical or, or what some would say is a top root sticking out. So anyway, we move on now to the greenhouse method. Now, those that want to check out YouTube and look at my older videos on greenhouse, they got a lot of hits because people had never seen it really done or talked about. 
at least six years ago when, well, seven years ago we started on YouTube. Um, people had never uh, ever heard of such methods, um, such as this as sweating it out. And really, it's it's not just about sweating. It's more about even moisture content staying in the seed um, at all times during the germination process. And again, that's about stability of the genetics. And uh, and that's basically the DNA. You can say like you got one set of genotype and that has a set of genetics, which is a bunch of uh, uh, basically DNA of the plant. And that can be destabilized. And often, to be quite honest, hybrids, you can expect destabilized. You can expect them, these ones here to come up looking different. That's something to, uh, to stay focused on as well when you're when you're raising your seeds and you're wondering why they look different, I suggest getting a breeder's book and starting to read up on, on phenotypes and, uh, and genotypes and, and uh, how to stabilize that, you know, F1, F2, F3, et cetera, for generations. Um, now, with this, now, I, I talked about the importance of understanding the greenhouse method because paper towel, either way, soak your seeds for at least 12 hours in distilled water, okay, or regular drinking water. And uh, also put a little bit of peroxide in there, a very uh, small dilution of maybe 10%, and that will help to sterilize the seeds and make sure that there's no fungus attack. You can also buy stuff at the, at the hydro store that will help you in that respect, but simple peroxide usually is enough. And, um, and uh, again, making sure that your medium that you're using, in this case, we've got a cocoa, um, a cocoa perlite, um, basically a Promix. A cocoa pro mix mix that's uh, that's more royal gold cocoa the best cocoa in the in the world that I'm using um, is something really easy to work with and uh, works great for for germination. So that's kind of what we're using in our base. And what's important, no matter what base you're using or what medium you're using, is that it it's able to run the water through nice and evenly, and that there's not going to be trapped moisture that could potentially cause your seed to rot out before it even has a chance to grow and, and sprout. So those are important things to look at. Now, in this method, when we're talking about paper towel, again, keeping the paper towel completely wet. Wet and warm, two things. Wet and warm and out of the dark, or out of the light. Wet, warm, and out of the light. Now, these are wet because they all came from the same cup. All three came from this cup of water. So they're all wet. So they're wet. In this method, they're already moist, and they're going to stay moist because they're sweating, which means that no water can escape. Now, wet and moist, we've got locked up in here, which is going to allow them to, again, that greenhouse effect and even water distribution. So that means that it's going to be able to make sure that there's even amounts of water as that seed comes up through the top. Now, you've got to think of it like the seed's breaking through the soil. Now, if this is crispy and dry, or if it's harder, the seed just might not have enough strength to poke through, or it has to fight harder. You know, and that's what's going to happen in this scenario, is where the top layer, because it is warmer, it's summertime, it's likely going to dry out the top layer, and in which cases, usually, you would just take your spray gun and give a couple of sprays on the top. Um, again, more handwork, that's unnecessary. Greenhouse method, it's already recycling the water. You'll notice after the first couple hours, you'll start to get your regular condensation that builds up onto the plastic. And the main thing that you need to watch for is that as soon as your, your top root goes down and your, 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 your initial um, uh, sprout comes up, you want to make sure that you get the plastic off and then allow it to grow naturally under your, whatever lights it is that you're going to use. You certainly don't need to put them under 1,000 watt headlights. You want to use something a little lower in spectrum. We will get into that. And another, on that note with light and spectrum, right now these seeds, as we've been doing this video, have been exposed to light. Now, because the radical or the taproot, if you have it, hasn't been cracked open and you, it hasn't been exposed to the light, it's not really a factor. Um, you know, you shouldn't really store seeds in the light to begin with. So it's light at any time is not really good on the seeds. Most importantly is that with this method, when these crack open, this is exactly what I do. When these crack open, I have to go like this and then I have to carefully grab each one and transplant them so that they continue to grow and you transplant them with the radical or the tap root pointing down and you would plant that in there which we will do when these crack and during that process of opening this up and then having to grab that seed the time it takes to transplant it time it takes to get the next one these seeds are exposed to light that light is stress 
It can cause a lot of problems to very expensive genetics or genetics that you found very hard to get. In some cases, we seek the world for the best genetics. We're in British Columbia, we have the best genetics. But protecting them, learning how to grow them, and learning how to farm them is a whole nother ball game. So it starts with learning how to germinate them and germinating them in the most safe way possible. Again, we take away the light because these ones, they're already underground and light doesn't penetrate through the dirt. So these are underground because of the plastic, they're kept even moisture. They're not gonna dry out on top like these ones. And unlike the paper towel method, these ones will likely already be sprouted by the time I'm even transplanting these, these ones in to get done. So when you're looking for efficiency, optimal, and again, you'll see that consistency of, uh, of the methodology being used here is, is what you're looking for in NEC germination. So by giving you all three perspectives, and we'll see how the seedlings come up, because they're all from the same seed set, they're all the same genetics. Let's see how they come up. Let's see what their male to female ratios are. Let's start studying some of their phenotypes and let's bring to you what we all should be studying as farmers because different strains for different pains. And if we can farm one today, you know, by doing everything right from point A to point C, um, then you can farm a new strain that potentially could help me medically or somebody else. And that's very important. So uh, we'll see you in part two where we actually get on to the, uh, or, or in the next part, where we get into the um, sprouts coming up and of course the transplanting of these and seeing the delay in the different times. And once again, always remember stress is not good and what happens in the root determines the fruit. So this is Jason Wilcox and we'll see you in the next part. Cheers. Again, this is to save our right to cultivate, to do what I'm doing here today, to be able to do this without fear of persecution from, you know, police, bylaws, or otherwise, you know, you should have a constitutional right to plant some seeds that God's given us and grow them, you know, and there shouldn't be any federal oversight for a plant that's clearly safe and harmless um, until they show some sort of toxicity or some sort of harm in it. I'm not gonna go into a rant. On that note, we'll bring back to you in the closing part when the plants are up and going and at what stages and uh, maybe close it out at that. This is Seed Germination 101. We'll see you next part. Welcome back. Okay, here we are at the final part. Now, as we've done it, we did the, the uh, seed germination with the paper towels. Again, I don't suggest that method. We see why and we're gonna demonstrate it again here today with the seedlings. Um, it's important to understand that germination, be it greenhouse methodology, whether you just stick it in the dirt um, or whether you use the paper towel, you may stress the genetics out, they're still gonna come up. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna fail, okay? So what matters here is which ones are growing faster, stronger and healthier because of the methodology used during the germination process. So here we can see nothing's come up really. Um, these are the paper towel. Now I'm surprised because this is only 48 hours after we put them down. So I thought they would take longer to recover, but these ones actually didn't take that long to recover and have come up. At the end of the day, we look at the four germination ones that we did. Well, they're marked by the elastics that are around them, the greenhouse method. Now again, the method that I sold to you, the reason I said we don't just stick them in dirt, you know, we want to have even moisture distribution the whole time through and you get an even uh, you see they're all generally the same height. Males will grow higher than females. That's normal part of uh, um, seedling production. And, uh, and of course, some will, will have a little more vigor and strength than others. Uh, most importantly, you can see the germination success rate, just like you've seen it in the paper towel in the previous part. So uh, what's more important is you fully understand that here's your success rate and look where these plants are and look at their vigor. They're all pulling over to the side because I took them away from just the windowsill not even needing any false light, because this time of the year we get over nine hours of light. Um, these guys are doing fine. Um, and they're just, they're all pulling to one side. And that's just showing that they're all pulling towards the sun. So each day you give them a little turn and make them pull another direction to help strengthen them up until it comes time to put them under proper lights and give them a little bit of wind to help strengthen the, uh, the outer sides. So with that being said, um, it's important, once again, protect your genetics, understand what germination is all about, and um, smoke your cannabis, enjoy your growing, and don't listen to all the hype.
because just because somebody says one thing works and it does, doesn't mean it's the most optimal. But if it works for you and you're happy with it, stick with it. If something like this interests you, try it out. It's Jason Wilcox. We'll see you in the next show. Cheers. Hey folks, we're here with my good friend Jason Wilcox. Yeah, yeah. And we're back in the grow room. And isn't this where it all began? Was in the grow room, grow room, and grow room. And that's where it all started. Was here in the grow room. And we're back in the grow room, in the grow room, in the grow room. And we're back in the grow room. And fuck no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back in the grow room. And Jason, isn't this where it all began? Was the grow room? Absolutely. This is where it all began. I came in here, my friend and my brother. You know, I came in here in 2012, and I said, "Look, man, they're gonna they're gonna take away our." Gardens. They're actually going to they're going to they're going to do this. If we I, I found that very that. alarming when you came to me and said they're going to take our right to grow away. It's like what, what can we do? What can we do? Or what did we do? Well, we raised the uh, raised the money for John Conroy. That was the first ten thousand. So I put up the money. Some other people put up some money. Green Planet put up some money. Rainbow Nutrients stepped forward and started putting up some money. Most importantly, Rainbow's wife Sandra also was was instrumental in the, in working as our secretary and making sure that our paperwork was done right. And everything. That, this is stuff that a lot of people don't necessarily know about. And it's going to come out in the documentary. And so look forward to this in 2020. This kind of a prelim to the documentary. And uh, we will have Rainbow in there. We will have Sandra, who's already been filmed. We still have to film this man. He's, oh, trying, yeah. he's trying to duck it out by dodging in here and, and making us do these pre-records for you guys. But you know what? It's a badass documentary. You want to know everything that happened and how we got to where we are and why the legalization task force was handcuffed on the issue of whether we can or can't grow in this country. It's because the medical patients of Canada made it constitutionally protected. And that made it possible for everybody to grow four plants. And though it's a small start, it's still a start and it protected the plants. And for that reason, Ramo, I thank you, my friend. It was all my all pleasure, you. Jason. You were the man with the plan. You know what we should do? We should go inside, smoke this huge joint, and talk about this. What do you think? Let's do it, brother. Let's go inside. get this captured on here check 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 check
because there's not much else I can do. No. So it is what it is. We're trying to make the show happen, and hopefully you guys are picking me up. I'm going to talk a little bit louder and closing it out. No. Um, <clears throat> we did have a question on dirt and, um, and H2O and sterilizing seeds. These, just as we close this out, good afternoon to anybody tuning in late. Um, Nobody can hear you, so you have to skip it. They can hear me now. Oh, there it is. Please stop telling me what they can and can't hear. I know, but you're on headphones. There's a delay and it interrupts the show. So, and my flow, <laughs> please. What's all good, Mr. Wilcox? What's all good with me is that I'm at the end of a show that got really screwed up at times and other times was good. Uh, most importantly, I got out what I wanted to get out was the information and the teaching. So there was a question about dirt and, and uh, using H2O. Um, when you start putting... Uh, that into your soil you would use that for fungus knots or for um, thrifts you would use an h2o solution um, as an option you know you can also use it to oxidate your roots and to sterilize you know a given medium that you plan on using if you're not sure if it's sterile um, there's nothing wrong with doing that uh, seeds when you soak your seeds the one thing we didn't talk about was do you use, like some people will put 10% bleach, some people will put 10% peroxide, whatever you feel will kill any antifungals or anything else that you're worried about being on the seeds, especially when they're coming from foreign countries and other places. There's a lot of people that get really anal about, about the seed part, but sterilization is something that is taught and, 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 and really asked people to do. Still smoking the wood, the green's much better. Um, I think he can stay across the road from her uncle, Robert O'Brien. Robert McDougall, you know him? No. Nope. I used to live across from your Robert O'Brien. What's that? He used to live across from oh Robert O'Brien. Are you kidding me? From her uncle. Yeah, well, are you reading oh, the chat? That's I'll smoke with anyone. <laughs> Robert McDougall, if you are who you say you are and you live near my Nana and Papa and my Uncle Robert, oh my goodness, what an amazing, awesome, it's so awesome you joined the show. Well, there's no way he would know that information. No, that's what I mean. You, you can't guess I that. From Bruce Hill. You know what, Robert? I've been there a, a number of times. Yes, I do. I'm not sure if we've ever met. Um, oh my goodness, what a small world. Well, how awesome is the world, right? <laughs> Oh, Cannabis connects people. I told Robert, you. You made my freaking day. If you see, if you see Robert, if you ever see Robert, please tell him I love him, and I would love to smoke one with him. And yes, you know what? I agree. You guys spend top dollar for shitty ass weed. Every time I go there, he's smoking cabbage. You're right. Or most of the time, he's smoking hash. Because that's what <coughs> Vicky, why don't you come on camera so they can actually see you? You look fine. No, I you can come on the camera long. They only see your waist up anyway. They can only see my face. Anyway, keep going. That's crazy. What's small world? It is a small world. Anyway, um, so as we close out the show, guys, again, uh, and ladies, uh, genetics, um, looking after them, using a greenhouse methodology. Again, we soak these seeds for 24 hours before we put them down. They popped in two days. Um, some seeds will take longer to pop. The other five that came from Spain, you know, they're just popping now. So they're, they're late. They're not as vigorous. They're not as quick to pop. It doesn't mean that they're no good. It just means that they're quick to pop. Um, I'm just reading over the comments, make sure I don't miss too much. The HDO comment, or the H2O comment was a great comment as well in question because people do use 10% peroxide, um, not only in their soils, but you know, um, also in their uh, routine washing of their hydroponics units. You know, it's just standard to use H2O, especially 35%, which you can get at your hydroponics store. You can't get it at your pharmaceutical store. So you have to understand the difference in the peroxides we're talking about. Um, and then the ratios that you use, you have to be careful. You use too much, you can, 
you can kill certain micro and macronutrients and most importantly you will kill macro and micronutrients so if you're an organic grower like me i don't go and use peroxide in my soil unless i got fungus knots or thrifts to deal with which i haven't knock on plastic i haven't had to do in a long time so hopefully that helps answer that um yeah, H2O2. I say H2O just because I think of water. I'm like too late. I'm too lazy to say the 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 last O or the last two. But again, using hydrogen peroxide is is what we're talking about here. Um, and again, there's three percent hydrogen peroxide you can get at your pharmaceutical store, or you can go get your thirty five percent pharmaceutical, uh, or sorry, your thirty five percent concentrated grade that you can get at your at your hydroponic store that sells it. And uh, that is what we're talking about using. Add a 10% to a 10% ratio or 5% ratio, whatever you feel comfortable with for sterilizing um, a given medium. It might be a medium that you may not know. It might be a medium that you ha are not familiar with, or you're not sure if it's sterile. It may have come from outdoors. It'd be smart to run hydrogen peroxide through it first, and then worry about refilling the nutrients later. You know, they're easy to replace. So the micro macronutrients I'm talking about, again, the H2O, really applies to the seeds. If you do it at the point of the seed, then you shouldn't have to really worry about the soil unless you don't know the source of the soil. In my case, my soil is always pro-mix and it comes in a sterile bag. I've yet to have a problem, so I don't really go there. Um, it is what it is. Uh, Tanya, cousin. Tanya Ball, thank you. You're 100 percent right. 30 percent, 35 percent, you can get, and and it is extremely dangerous. And if you dump it on your hand, you'll actually realize just why it's not in pharmaceutical stores and not just lying around the house. It's sort of like bleach, you know. And you do need to be careful when you're using it. Um, it, it it's used for for a host of different things. Most importantly, it will help. It will help um, re reoxidate your water or your rooting system. <clears throat> so if you're sterilizing your, your soil and you've got roots that have grown down in there, you're actually oxidating your roots by adding the, the, the solution of uh, hydrogen peroxide. But because of the way the bubbles, it causes natural irrigation in the rooting system. So that's fine, that's all good. But at the same time, there's a consequence to losing macro and micronutrients in, in favor of irrigation of the rooting system. So you have to look at which is, which is good, which is bad. There's not a right or wrong answer here on Cannabis in Canada. That's one thing I want everybody to understand. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. We're, I'm saying I'd like to discuss any of this. Y'all got lots of brains out there and y'all been grown now and now we're legalized. I've been doing this shit since 2007. You know? What was that? That's almost, that's almost 13 years. So I've been doing this 12 years. I've been on the air teaching how to grow cannabis. I've taught over 600 videos of, of actual grow videos on how to grow cannabis. But then I've went on to, to do what I'm doing now. And that's why I replayed my old video. Rather than go and redo a whole new video on how to, there's two different methodologies and one's better than the other because of X, Y, and Z. It's easier for me to let you decide for yourself whether it's better for X, Y, and Z, or maybe down the road, if you get into cannabis or get geeky like I did with cannabis, you'll get start reading books, you'll start doing shit that people haven't done before, and then you'll be like, damn, man, that's what I want to do. You know, I figured this shit out. Now I, can, now I made the connection. It takes years of study and not just book. Again, I often say, you can read all the fucking books you want, you can take all the courses you want, but until you've grown a root to fruit, you ain't done shit. You ain't no grower, you ain't shit. I don't care what certificates you have, I don't care what botany school you went to, I don't care what's, what fingers are up your ass and makes you feel you're better than us, you know, but you're not. It's a fucking plant. But it takes years to learn how to grow it to the connoisseur level, to the sticky icky level. And I'm proud to say I'm there. I'm cocky enough to say I'm there. I'm still here on the motherfucking air 12 years later saying it. <laughs> So anyway, with that being said, is there any questions at all? I mean, it's an interesting discussion, but it's, it's a discussion that is, it, it, it isn't right or wrong. A lot of people will use the paper towel method and have absolutely no problems through their whole career, never knowing that that one time 
That one time you got a hermaphrodite and you didn't know why, it was because you germinated your seeds in front of the light. You don't know, nor do I. It's just a theory. But one thing we do know is that stress on the cannabis plant at any point is bad and can force the cannabis plant to become a hermaphrodite, both male and female, and pollinate the entire room. Worst case scenario. This is why we teach all these steps and we talk about all this craziness. A, of course A, I'm, Can I'm Canadian, eh? Trust me, I lived in America for a couple, I, I, lived in, I lived in America for a couple of years and, huh? You got some soda, huh? But huh? Canadian, what was that, huh? You, you know what I'm talking about, right, huh? 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 You got some soda? Huh? Hey? I know. You know, honestly, when I came back from Cali, I lived in Cali for a couple of years, and when I came back from Cali, that was during the LA riots of all times. What a way to be introduced to that fucking city. But anyway, um, you know, going through that and then coming back home, I remember I had the accent and I sounded American and I asked for soda, I didn't ask for pop. And, and I definitely, A, sounded funny hearing Don Cherry when, you know, when he was on, 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 the, on the hockey saying, A, it sounded so funny to me because I had been in America too long. So I get it when the Americans and my Australian friends find us to be saying it funny. But you know what? It's our national pride to say A, and I'm proud to be Canadian, eh? No fucking A. Fucking A. I'm doing a dab for that one. I'm doing a dab for Canada, eh? Fucking A. I tell you, having to learn how to change though, having to get rid of that A when I broke into America and I was on the run from Canada, um, I had to hide. So I was hiding in America, so I had to change my accent real fast. I had to learn how to stop asking for pops and to stop saying A and to stop saying huh, you know, um, or, or start saying huh and stop saying out. Now you guys might not know this, but Americans say out. Canadians say out. We just say out. We don't pronounce the T. So I had to learn that real quick because when police or anybody else is questioning you and you're on federal warrant and you're wanted, you should probably tell the truth and make sure that you're able to cover your ass and make sure you got your alibi down pat. And no matter what, don't say A. Even if your alibi is that you're from the Hudson Projects in Detroit, which are close to Canadian border, which would explain any accent to an officer. But that's just being a smart ass 19 year old kid, um, which I was. <laughs> <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, you guys see how many freaking stars we got jumping into the cannabis game now? We got more and more stars jumping into the cannabis game, acting like they, they, they were never in it before. And, and the hypocrisy in all this is that they're, they're the ones that helped us to get legal. Here we are talking about how to grow your seeds, and the government doesn't like necessarily that we're out teaching people how to grow seeds. They would rather us teach you how to buy from them so that you can go home and make your own bubble hash. It's like, why don't you grow your own and make your own bubble hash? Let's get a killer bong fucking... Let's get a killer bong today. That's what we should do. You're gonna buy the bong? Awesome. I'm down for, for that. I went looking for a slide. We can't find a bong slide anywhere. Hey, hi, Kim from Mexico. That's freaking awesome. Hey, Kim hey, from Mexico. That's right on. Awesome. Welcome to Cannabis in Canada. Yeah. Where we don't see borders, trust me, after going to Australia, Vicky and I do not see borders. One thing we learned is that we're all under the same oppression. It's just, it comes in different, it comes in different lessons and it comes in different oppressions. Okay. And, and that's based on constitutions. Today's a funny show because we just popped on to do, because <coughs> once these pop and they've got cellophane over them, once they get to this height, that's the exact height that you want them, but you want to make sure that you get that plastic off or they'll start to go moldy and you'll mold your seed. That's the risk of doing the greenhouse methodology. You have to be an attentive grower. And <clears throat> that's why I wanted to bring that up. But with so many people popping their jelly beans, boom, 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 across the country, but then calling me and saying, Jason, I popped my jelly beans, man. Is there anything I should know? And it's like, how deep did you pop it? And he goes, I don't know, man. I stuck my finger down in there and then I just stuck the damn seed in. Well, I'm like, how long is your finger? Oh, well, I don't know, about four inches? And I'm like, well, you should probably plant seed about two centimeters or two millimeters under the soil. You know, two to four millimeters tops. 
<laughs> definitely not your finger. So um, it, it's just an example of where, where and why we do these shows and why we teach these different methodologies. And there's so many you can learn. There, there's different methodologies that you can learn um, while doing this. Again, the paper towel being the most common one. If you want something easy, just please do it in a dark place, in a warm, dark place. Remember, the less light you can put on the seeds, the less you're going to stress them out. Because when you use that paper towel method, at least you know you got 100% germination, you got a cracked radical. It doesn't mean it's going to transfer over and into the dirt and not die in the process. It was just born. It's like taking an infant and throwing it down the lane and hoping that it's going to fucking live. You know, that's how I view it. But they, because it's such a, such a success rate, I had a huge success rate using paper towel. That's why I did the video and I showed I had 100% success rate with paper towel. I had 100% success rate with greenhouse. But what I showed was how greenhouse had absolutely no stress on the seeds, was faster, and was already into stage two buckets, while the ones that were done in paper towel were still being staged up. So there's a time issue, there's a proper methodology issue, <clears throat> and then there's, of course, uh, a success issue. And for anybody who's ever bought seeds, grown seeds, know what it's like to put down your jelly beans and you're like getting all excited, last thing you want are duds. Last thing you want is a failed methodology. So what we teach here on Cannabis in Canada is methodologies that work, that we feel are going to work for you, and that we know are going to work for all of us. So um, that's what matters. Oh, let's see what else we got here. Any other questions? That I'm, oh, you're not watching on, on, uh, on stretching. Have you heard about stretching? Stretch, of course, see, Keith. Uh, stretching is common. Uh, the stretching is common. What does that tell you? That tells you that you don't have the right light spectrum. You need over 400 nanometers of light. And if you don't got that, your plants are going to stretch. You're going to get large inner node spacing. And when the larger the inner node spacing, the more they're stretching. And eventually they're going to fall over and they're going to get all spindly. That's because you're mistreating your plants. They don't have the right light spectrum. Best way to test the light. Like I've been testing lights now for 10 years. So if I test the light, best way I know is the way the plant responds to the light. There's positive topism, praying to the light. And then there's negative, where it folds to protect itself. The plant looks like a bat hanging. It's just protecting itself. That's not what you want. So it is a good question. And it's something that we, 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 you do, I, I have heard of, but I also know why. It's not just hearing of it. It's knowing why it happens. First thing Einstein taught us is, is logic has to dictate reason. You know, it's one thing you have to look at. So why does this stretch? That's the first thing I thought when I found my plant stretching. Because I was using chicken coop lights because I was too fucking stupid to know any better. But this was like 20 years ago, you know? Like shit, we we're still building our ballast with, 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 we used to break in the city yard and, and build our ballast in our goddamn coffee cans. That's how stupid we were, you know? But that, that was early day growing. That's what reefer madness did. But when you see those plants stretching, then you don't see it outdoor, but you'll see it outdoor on cloudy days. If you see outdoor where you get two, two weeks of cloud and there's just no sun, you'll actually see your plants stretch a little bit. Most importantly, it's not outside, but inside. I tell you now, if you don't have over 400, optimal is between 420 and 480 nanometers of light. So you can check you know, uh, your lux. Um, with, with a, with a, or your par rating uh, using, a, using a Lux reader, a, a, light, a light reader. Uh, you can go ahead and check what it is that your light is putting out. If it's not putting out over 420 nanometers, that's why your plants are stretching. If it is putting out 420, then it's not dialed into the right spectrum. And I know this sounds confusing, but you really have to get into lighting to, get, to understand all of this. It goes right into why you can dial in your diodes um, with different things. Um, there's a lot of different things going on at one time. 400 mH, 1000 HPS. I don't know what that is. I, well, T5, I know what a T5 is. Um, I have four of them upstairs. I use the T5s only for this stage for veg. That's the only time they get used. 
Um, <clears throat> then you stage up from T5 to a 600 and then to a 1,000 if possible. Um, but that's a choice. Um, there's also a lot of people looking at LEDs. Now, my problem with LEDs is that there's all these claims that they're over 400 nanometers. But then when you actually get to the company and you ask them, they'll tell you the truth, that they're actually under 400 nanometers. They're about 380. They're getting there, they're giving us the technology, and there's a couple of them that actually are over 400 nanometers. And they're getting within that proper wavelength, that proper spectrum, where cannabis grows ideally. But remember, it's a large spectrum. And plants respond differently. It's the same reason that we have metal halide lights and we have high pressure sodium lights. I can, I can assure you, if you put a high pressure sodium light in um, a, a vegetative state, and a plant that, that is being under-lighted, under, underlit, like because it's too big a room for one light, for instance, um, you could find stretching at the back plants because they're getting less light. You'll see them stretching, but the ones right under the light will be just fine. That's another good way to be able to understand what I'm trying to teach you about lighting. <clears throat> stretching, 100%, has to do with lighting. Um, or bad genetics. If you got bad genetics that are actually got huge internal spacing, you may want to get rid of that because it's a good indicator of what it's gonna, what it's gonna yield. Efficiency doesn't equal weight and fruit. Like you asked me, and, and like I said again, if you if you can't, um, if you can't stop the stretching, the stretching is an indicator that they're not getting enough light. If they're not getting enough light, they're not gonna produce enough fruit. What happens in the root determines the fruit, but without the light, you ain't got no fruit. You have to have the right light. It has to be over 420 nanometers. If you fix that, you'll fix your problem and you'll get a bigger yield. And I'm not saying that you won't get your yield or that you're not saving money. We can all save money. Hell, you can grow cannabis under a chicken coop light and still get a little tiny bud. And technically, you're saving money. Right? Just pointing this out. Efficiency really matters. Efficacy. Well, well that, that too. Well, again, you're, you're looking at um, efficacy. Most 1.9 to 2 volts. 2.2. Again, I don't know how these... Um, no, no, I, I get that you're, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not taking it in any way other than um, trying to understand what it is that, you see, to me, somebody can come in and read me off um, six different spectrums, six different specs of six different types of lights. That don't mean shit to me until I put that light up and I test it with a light meter and make sure that one, it's over 400 nanometers. And then two, I put it to the, t to the test by growing the plant from root to fruit. Now, if your fruit ain't that big, then you have to look at what is the reason. It's either your climate, your food, your, your medium, or it's your light. And most often, the number one culprit for undersized buds is light. Because people try to cheap out. They're always trying to cheap out. They're trying to run fluorescence because it's cheaper. Well, they do good in veg. Well, yeah, they do good in veg because they don't need as much light in veg. But when they actually have to produce fruit, it takes a lot more light, a lot more energy, a lot more photosynthesis out of the plant. It also needs those 12 hours of dark. And you also have to be able to control that climate, both in the dark and in the light. And without understanding that, it becomes, it becomes a problem. How am I doing on bars? Am I going to be shutting off here? Because I'm going to die here. You do. You get what you pay for. And that, that's, that's a reality. Oh, you're, yeah. You're on, you're, you're, you're giving me a white line through it. So it should probably wrap up. Yeah. So I'm pretty, much, uh, I'm pretty much running out of battery life, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's show. It was Canvas Canada's Thursday show. And uh, Thursdays, oh, Sundays. Oh. We'll see you at Sunday at 6 p.m. If I do not, if it cuts out, that you know why it's camera, camera shit. Um, um, and that's pretty much the uh, the long and the short of it. I can't get into any further. And if you're 
plants are stretching for the first 21 days in your garden. Why? I just answered your question why. It's probably just a delay that's happening in YouTube. So I wouldn't really worry about it too much because honestly, the first 21 days, if your plants are stretching, okay, at any time, right now they shouldn't be stretching. I mean, I'm, they might stretch a little bit when they're seedlings because they're stretching, they're, they're really, they're, they're reaching to try and get themselves established. Under the proper light spectrum, I've never had a seedling stretch. So the stretching, if your plants are stretching, again, I'd look to your light source, you know, before I'd look to anything else. Um, that or else, look at, at the genetics. All said, this is Jason Wilcox. Thank you, for everybody, for tuning in, and um, thanks for the questions. We had some good grow questions today, and we're going to keep it going. Um, and with each show, we're going to continue to grow. We'll see you in the next one. Cheers.